Hello everyone, Pineapple here with the next instalment into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Thor, directed by Kenneth Branagh of all people. As I waited, I have to tell you rather disappointedly upon my breakfast, <clears throat> difficulty with eggs, you don't need to know this. Paired with a Dutch angle fetish that's quite prevalent in this film, matching Quentin Tarantino's One for Feet. After The Incredible Hulk and Iron Man 2, another slot in the Avengers was filled by this film. Only a year after Iron Man 2, and the same year as the next instalment, Captain America The First Avenger. I remember liking this film for the most part when it released, so let's see if the introduction to the God of Thunder holds up today. Even if my brain is now unable to disregard the sporadic nature of the cinematography. The movie opens up in New Mexico with a science squad, consisting of Jane Foster, played by Natalie Portman, Kat Dennings, played by Darcy Lewis, and Eric Selvig, played by Stellan Skarsgård, also known as the guy that almost let Julie Walters die. And they are scientists looking into atmospheric disturbances, and find a light from the heavens, and Jesus Christ, already every second shot is a Dutch angle. This is not substantive. This is a lazy way of creating spectacle. The CGI holds up pretty well as a tornado like Aurora hits the ground, and the crew chase after it, spinning out and hitting a guy, who we don't get to see the face of, but is probably Thor. Then we get thrown into Flashback Land, narrated by Odin, played by Anthony Hopkins. He tells us the story of early mankind, and how the Asgardians protected them and others from the invading force of the Frost Giants. And while I don't find myself caring about this past big battle like I would in, say, Lord of the Rings or another fantasy like that, the character designs are cool, and when you can actually see the action, it's nice. But granted, it is a lot of quick flashes and movement for a time. Odin defeated their king, and he took their power source, showing us the impressive visual of Asgard. Something that stays consistently good looking from here on. So props to the designers of this movie for getting the tone right. It turns out Odin is telling this story to his young children, trying to give them a lesson. And to be fair, this little kid sounds exactly like Chris Hemsworth as Thor. Odin tells the children only one can be king, and now in the future we see Thor in his impressive armour. Actually, all his outfits are pretty good. Publicly meeting with his father, and wow, look at that throne. Odin must have a very small penis. We also get a look at supporting characters. Thor's mother, Siv, and the Warriors 3. Hold on, is that Prince Charming? Hold on, what the hell is your name? Yeah. David! Your cursed name? My real name. What, you're David James Ann Charming? Or David's like a middle name? No, it's my name name. You know what, I'm gonna call you whatever I damn well please. Anyway, all this hubbub is about Odin giving us some exposition on Mjolnir. And we see Loki, now played by Tom Hiddleston, standing off to the side as Thor gives his pledge to be king. But Frost Giants enter Odin's vault to take their weapon back, causing Odin to unleash the Destroyer. That we'll see more of later. Odin is content that the vault is secure, but Thor is out for blood, much to Odin's dismay, proclaiming he is not king yet. Which is weird, because wasn't that what the whole previous ceremony was about? Wikipedia says so, and you know they're always a reputable source. Thor throws a tantrum, and wow, looking at the newer Marvel movies, it's almost impressive how much character development Thor will have, compared to some of the less fleshed out characters we can get in newer Marvel products. Even if Thor's character will take a turn from fish out of water to bumbling fool. Loki appears to console his brother and butter him up, and very clearly dropping Thor hints to break the rules and assault the Frost Giants. The Warriors 3 and Siv rightly tell him he is insane, but you can see the genuine chemistry they all have as Thor gets them to follow his lead. The journey of the Rainbow Bridge is visually impressive, and they have to get past Heimdall, played by Idris Elba. A character I like a lot, but as he wants answers on how the Frost Giants got in, he allows them passage. Jotunheim looks pretty well realised as well, as they address the leader of the Giants, who rightfully calls out the Asgardian's faults. I mean, I'm sure he's a dick too, but he does make good points. Loki is actually the voice of reason, but Thor thinks with his muscles instead, and the ensuing fight has some good moments. Loki's arm turning blue as he is touched by a giant. And they become overwhelmed, fleeing, but manage to survive until Odin arrives, to appease Laufey, who declares war, 
but has his shit rocked by Odin escaping with the rest. Odin is a smidge angry as Loki stands silent, waiting for his family to finish screaming at one another, then attempting to appease Odin, only to get this reaction. Father. I don't think even Anthony Hopkins knew what that reaction was. Odin proclaims Thor unworthy with some decent acting, taking his armor and Mjolnir, casting him to Earth as punishment, and casting the classic curse slash requirement onto it, meeting us back at the movie's cold open, where we see Thor wake and meet Jane and the bunch. Darcy rightfully tases the rambling Thor as Jane attempts to document the phenomenon, and we see Mjolnir land not too far away from where Thor landed. We then get a scene of them taking Thor and attempting to enter him into a hospital, where he wakes and has to be sedated. Which I'm sure someone found funny, but personally, I think I'd rather skip this, like everyone does to Charlie's mother song in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. The next day, a man in his car discovers Mjolnir, embedded in the ground and unable to be removed, giving a justifiable reaction. In the small town of Puente Antigo, apparently quite small but big enough for a 7-Eleven, Chain and the gang start analysing their records, discussing a wormhole I assume was the Bifrost, seeing a readout of Thor falling through the wormhole. And I probably shouldn't, but I find this photo very funny. Like it's a still from that clip of Kratos falling while Dream On plays. Jane decides to head back to the hospital, and we jump back there as Thor is in denial of his imprisonment, but manages to escape before the scientists and their infinite Dutch angles arrive. Seriously, I'm starting to get sick here. Jane and the science squad resolve to find him, but hit him with the car in an admittedly funny scene. And we jump back to Mjolnir, who a bunch of trucker stereotypes and Stan Lee attempt to remove from the ground, with no such luck, getting the attention of Agent Coulson, played again by Clark Gregg, this being connected to the end credits of Iron Man 2. With a fun reference to the Thor comics, he gets to talk with Jane, who I never noticed is either short or Chris Hemsworth is far taller than I thought, because she only just reaches his shoulders. Thor demands sustenance, and back in Asgard Thor's friends regret not reining him in, Loki revealing he informed Odin, saving them. Loki refuses Siv's plea to change Odin's mind, and they play with the idea that Loki had betrayed them to Jotunheim. Loki grabs the power source they were after, but Odin stops him. It's here we get to see Loki's true form, being one of the frost giants, Laufey's son, abandoned and stolen by Odin and raised by him. Tom Hiddleston's performance excels here, and while Anthony Hopkins could be used better, literally falling unconscious halfway through the scene, its weight to Loki's character is grand, and you can see why Tom Hiddleston has played the character all the way up till recently. On Earth, they take Thor to a diner, which is funny, and I suppose it's a nice interaction between Jane and Thor. The most interesting thing is seeing the half-destroyed flatbed in the background coming back from trying to pull Mjolnir. Thor hears about it from some others and attempts to take it back, bartering travel for information while Darcy desperately tries to have funny interjections while Eric tries to stop everyone from going mad. So far, these two haven't been used very well, and considering both return later down the line, in what at this point seems like far better roles, I hope they get more to do soon. Then again, I'm not too sold on Jane yet, but at least she's more emotive than Liv Tyler. Jane is convinced by Eric to let Thor go on his own, so he thanks them and leaves, but not before Jane almost looks like she'll recreate that scene from meeting Joe Black. Another Anthony Hopkins movie. At their workstation, Coulson starts taking their shit, and Jane genuinely lashes out at Coulson, who attempts to be civil, so already with this one scene, I think she ups Liv Tyler, but I think a lot of the direction could have been better here, both with the camera and the performances. We get a good look at the town as well, and look at how remote the place is. Why do they have a 7-Eleven? Eric references Hulk with a barely legible line read I had to look up to understand, and in Asgard, Loki has taken the throne in Odin's stead, as Odin has fallen into the Odin sleep. What the fuck that is, and why he had to name his own sleep after himself, you'll have to Google it. Because Loki doesn't describe it. Thor's friends try to get Thor back, and Loki makes some decent sounding points as to why not to bring Thor back. 
even if there is an obvious self-serving undertone. It's clever how he justifies it. Eric picks up a book on Norse mythology, indulging himself in the stories, but scoffs at any validity they may have. Thor gets another fish out of water scene, although gratefully it's decent and it doesn't overstay its welcome. Jane ending up taking him to the site anyway. The scene between the two is fun and good natured. As someone who isn't really sold on Natalie Portman, especially after the Star Wars prequels, I am enjoying her here. Loki gets a good scene with his mother, who while a minor character, played by Rene Russo, who has a good performance, but spends most of it sucking on Odin's metaphorical dick. So you know, one of those, it's always the way God intends it kind of people, without actually taking any responsibility. But seems to genuinely care about her children. It's nice when Thor arrives at the shield base, determined to just break in and take Mjolnir, and we get to see a quick cameo by Maximilio Hernandez as Agent Sitwell, the shield agent that will appear later down the line. And it's satisfying to watch this movie for the first time in years and notice little cameos like this, another one coming up shortly. The action of Thor getting into the base is decent, but some of the action could be shot better. Some of it too zoomed in, and a flash of lightning making an obvious and disorientating cut, a common use of obstruction meant to emulate a one-take sequence, but failing. That I will never be able to unsee. Better than Thor's action is Hawkeye's introduction. Subtle as to who the character is, but it's hype when you realise who you're watching, Jeremy Renner playing the character as he would in later films. Thor reaches the hammer after fighting the token Big Thug in the Mud Pit for a bit, but is unable to lift it, as he has not yet had enough character development to be considered worthy. A nice idea to use Mjolnir's vow here, just over the movie's halfway point, enough time for him to believably grow instead of it feeling forced by the end. Although I think the sound design as he pulls the hammer specifically could have used some retooling, making Chris Hemsworth a desperate performance feel more like constipation, or what is just a smidge away from being such a great scene. Even Coulson's look is great. Eric shows Jane the storybook that she now starts to believe could be possible, and Coulson gets some good words in with Thor. Which could be great, but the cinematography is utter dog shit. Every shot is tilted and it's a roller coaster as you're sitting, trying to look straight. I attempted to and my head was turning left to right so quickly I felt like it might fall off. Loki appears to Thor and informs him of Odin's death. Yeah, now is when Loki is blatantly the bad guy. Although his fit is great looking. He tells Thor that Frigga has refused to let Thor return, which I suppose in a way is true, but holy shit, the score and acting in this scene is what we almost got before at the Hammer. If it just weren't for the dog shit camera angles, that scene would have been a 10 out of 10. Loki tries to take the Hammer, but fails, and Eric walks right into the shield base, talking bullshit about Thor's human identity that they falsified. And I like seeing Eric try to get him freed. But even though they know it's bullshit, they let him go anyway. But not without one last jab, sending agents to follow them. Thor and Eric speak over a beer, and I like their conversation. It's clear that Odin's apparent death is already changing him as a character, but Eric doesn't want him hurting Jane, so demands him out of town ASAP. Loki heads back to Jotunheim to see Laufey, confirming that he has been betraying Thor all along, and promising to sneak them into Asgard to kill Odin properly. Heimdall is onto his shit in a tense scene when he returns, but obeys him. Thor returns, a very drunk Eric, and Jane's awkward energy lends well to the comedic tone. Outside they talk pretty endearingly, and he returns a journal that he swiped from S.H.I.E.L.D. And I like that although Thor doesn't really get everything she says, he helps show her the connection between their beliefs. And the score is noticeably good here. It's a much better emotional scene than we've gotten between Bruce and Betty, and probably Pepper and Tony, which are subject to the copious amounts of comedy that infect any scene where Tony Stark tries to be in love. Thor's friends once again try and figure out what to do, resolving to help Thor, but Heimdall requests them as soon as they mention it. And the comedic timing is on point, him letting them through the gate, not technically disobeying since he leaves, but they make their way to Earth tracked by S.H.I.E.L.D. Thor seems to have slid in well to the domestic lifestyle, and Loki retrieves the destroyer from before, sending it to Thor as his crew arrive in the town, strangely referred to by S.H.I.E.L.D. Siv and the Warriors 3 introduce themselves and refute Loki's BS claims. 
Loki confronts Heimdall in what could have been a cool fight, but just one-shots him, freezing him. S.H.I.E.L.D. thinks it's Iron Man, but scatters it blows them up. Thor wanting to evacuate the town, and the timing is all off here. In the span of 30 seconds, it looks like the town is half evacuated. The destroyer arrives in town, and the warriors walk like 10 paces. It's not terribly consistent at all. And oh no, the 7-Eleven! The CGI as the warriors fight is a bit dodgy, but the destroyer and Civ look pretty well done. I just wish that there weren't so many touch angles. The CGI in practicals once again goes back and forth between shoddy and great as the destroyer blows shit up. Thor has a good scene with Civ and the warriors sending them back to Loki. While they escape, he confronts the destroyer head on, and yeah, this scene is pure hype. Less Dutch angles than before, or even if they're there, but the score in Thor speaking with Loki is fantastically done, as he offers himself for the people, and Jane rushes in to help him. Look, I get you want a couple by the end of the movie, and these two have chemistry, but I think it's too quick here. At this point, I can believe they're becoming very good friends, but the romantic angle that is clearly being established to anyone who's seen a movie before probably required more exploration, either a longer runtime or pushing it a little further back into the second movie. Thor is down, but not out, and Mjolnir flies to help Thor. A flashback to Odin, plainly communicating that he has learned his lesson, and he suits up and kicks the destroyer's ass, with pretty believable reactions from Eric and Jane. Coulson interrupts, ready to be the good government guy again, and Thor lifts off with Jane as Laufey makes it to Asgard. Heimdall getting his epic moment, breaking out of the ice, and murking the two frost giants. Bringing them back home after Thor says his goodbyes, vowing to return, and getting to Mac on Natalie Portman. Frigga takes up arms against the frost giants, but is beaten, and Laufey gets a great monologue against Odin, but is blown away by Loki who swears to kill them for what they've done. But Thor comes along to out him. You are gay! The funny thing is, the both of them want to destroy Jotunheim. Their stupidity just comes out in different ways. Loki luring them into Asgard for no particular reason, I guess to sway public opinion his direction. But really, he's king, so why does that matter? And Thor just wanted to jump in stupidly, both on either ridiculous extremes of brash and calculated. The visuals are interesting as Thor arrives and tries to stop Loki from destroying Jotunheim with the Bifrost. And it's a pretty good climax, showing their growth, Thor becoming better and Loki becoming crueler. It makes for good heart behind the fight, even if some of the sound effects are dodgy, sounding like you're playing Peglin bits. And the editing could be a little better. Loki uses his illusions, but is beaten by Thor, who uses the only option available to him, Finally, placing Mjolnir on Loki, and destroying the Bifrost in order to save Jotunheim. Paying the price of not being able to go back to Earth as simply as before. This climax is definitely my favourite part of the movie. Powerful emotionally, tense and looking fantastic, with only minor CGI failures. Odin wakes to save them, but Loki refuses to be saved and lets go. And seriously Odin, your kid's about to die, and all you can muster is Jane is all sad, and I'm sure we'll never see her again. And on Asgard, we get to see Thor, mourning Loki, and the absence of Jane. And finally getting some decent positivity from Odin. We'll never be a wiser king than you. Or a better father. Fucking bullshit. This guy is emotionally unavailable, raised you wrong, and then banished you for making the decisions you thought he would be proud of. And all he could muster to not let his other son, the adopted one, die was... No, Loki. No. I hate Odin in this movie. Well, then again, that may be accurate as I've been told from certain points of view that he's a real dick in classic mythology as well. We get one last look at Heimdall and Jane before getting into the obligatory end credit scene where Eric traverses an underground base, meeting with Nick Fury to tease the Tesseract, which I'm sure won't be in the next movie at all. And we also see Loki manipulating Eric, clearly not as gone as we thought he was. So that was Kenneth Branagh's Thor. And when it comes to the movie as a whole, it was pretty good, with a stellar finale and well-handled cameos. Thor and Loki's characters were explored quite well, and their changes felt mostly natural to the characters as the movie progressed. I wish Eric and Darcy got more to do, although 
There are some things I think could be fixed about Jane Foster's character. The performance and the way she interacts with Thor, for the most part, was nice to see. Then there are the downsides. Lazy direction and cinematography, attempting to look epic and stylish by tilting the camera to such a wide variety of angles so fast, it makes you want to be sick. And at times, the score felt flat or out of place. But even though it had a lot of problems, I like this one a fair bit and see a lot of quality in it. Iron Man 2 got a 7 out of 10 as I added on my personal biases, but probably could have gone lower. And while this probably isn't as good as Iron Man 1, I think the good here outweighs the bad. So if you can get over the Dutch angles and Odin being a dick, I'd recommend the movie at a 7.5 out of 10, making it the second best of the MCU so far. Thank you everybody for watching my review of the movie Thor. Please like the video if you liked it, Comment down below if you wish, or if you have a recommendation or something you'd like me to check out on the channel. And consider subscribing to the channel, and if you do, ring that notification bell so you're told every single time that I make an upload. Once again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next review. Bye! Toast. A little piece of toast. Because there's so much to choose from. There's brown bread, white bread, all sorts of wholemeal bread. It comes in friendly packages, but writing on the side.